everyone, and welcome to the regular City Council meeting of August the 18th, 2020. We will be calling the meeting to order, and we have all council members present today, so there will be no issues with corn. We will start today with the chaplain prayer, and Gary and Marcella Jenkins are here today to share uh, words with us. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mayor and everybody on the council. Uh, just a quick word, we are married, living together, so we do practice social distancing, but uh, we're here in the house. So nevertheless, uh, it's good to be here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we bow before you to say thank you for another day that you've made. And we thank you for our mayor, the Honorable Brenda Gunter, the members of the San Angelo City Council, and all of those that are here with us on this Zoom City Council meeting. Father in heaven, we pray that you will shine your light of love and wisdom upon the members of the council, that they will be able to conduct the business of the city in a spirit of excellence that will glorify you and be a blessing to the inhabitants of the city of San Angelo. Father, as we continue with this COVID-19 uh, upon us, we pray, God, that you will touch the hearts of everyone in San Angelo to continue to practice social distancing and to wear our masks and to uh, do all of the things that our officials are telling us to do to protect ourselves and each other. We pray, Father, for the families that lost loved ones because of COVID-19, that you will surround them with your love, your grace, and your mercy, and Lord, comfort them during this time. Father, we pray that this city will be a city that you're pleased with. For your word says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And so, Father, you are our Lord, and we bow before you to say thank you for this day. Bless our mayor, bless the members of the city council and all of those that uh, are in positions of leadership within city government. We thank you for our first responders, our firefighters, and all of those that are with us. And we ask you now, Lord, set your seal of approval on this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. God bless you. With that, we will move into... Um, uh, public comment, but just to remind everyone that all members of the council and staff should begin speaking by stating their full name and SMD position or role within the city. Following that incredible prayer, I would like to offer the following proclamation. If I could just pull it up, and it looks like I'm going to struggle with a cell phone this morning. So here we go. Um, this proclamation is from the office of the mayor, and it is as following. We will be joining Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas in this proclamation. And it is as follows. Whereas the COVID-19 pandemic had brought illness and death to many residents of San Angelo, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has caused great economic harm, putting people out of work, closing businesses and bringing hunger and hardship to many residents of San Angelo. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic interrupted the education of the children of San Angelo and put our educators at risk. And whereas the COVID-19 continues to spread throughout San Angelo and whereas the best human efforts have not yet found a, a cure and whereas throughout the history of San Angelo, the state of Texas and our nation, people have turned to God in prayer to bring healing and deliverance where human efforts have failed. And whereas August 19th, 2020 shall be designated as Pray San Angelo Day, a day of prayer for the eradication of COVID-19 from the city of San Angelo. And whereas residents of San Angelo are encouraged to pray in place, whether at home, at work, or at school at the noon hour on August 19th, 2020. And whereas, uh oh, and whereas the House of Faith are encouraged to ask their pray people to pray wherever they are at noon on August 19th, 2020. And whereas all are encouraged to unite in prayer, humbly asking God to eradicate COVID-19 
and heal San Angelo. And whereas, let us also re rededicate ourselves to bringing back healing to the sick, comfort to the brokenhearted, help to the needy, wisdom to our children, hope to the hopeless, and unify the city of San Angelo. Therefore, the city of San Angelo does hereby proclaim Wednesday, August 19th, 2020, as Prayer San Angelo Day. And testimony whereof we have hereunto set our hands and caused the official seal of the city of San Angelo, Texas to be affixed this 19th day of August, 2020. And tomorrow, the House of uh, uh, Freedom Fellowship Church at 12 noon will read this. Anyone who would like to participate in the event, it's at 12 noon at Freedom Fellowship on Chadburn, and everyone is encouraged to attend. Today, we would also like to read a proclamation as follows. The Girl Scouts of Central Texas, San Angelo, are celebrating the 2020 Women of Distinction. The 2020 Women of Distinction honorees are Bonnie Lou Campbell, Clarissa Darby, Billy F. DeWitt, Mary Frentz, and Camille Yell. The 2020 Distinguished Workplace for Women is the San Angelo Chamber of Commerce. The honorees have contributed their time, talent, and passions to benefit San Angelo and the surrounding area known as the Concho Valley. The honorees serve as examples and mentors to Girl Scouts in the San Angelo and surrounding areas. Girl Scout programming follows the four Girl Scout pillars, outdoor skills, entrepreneurship, life skills, and STEM. San Angelo is fortunate to have Girl Scouts training local girls to be leaders of tomorrow with the courage, confidence, and character to make the world a better place. Now, therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim August 18th, 2020, as 2020 Girl Scout Women of Distinction Day in San Angelo, Texas, and encourage citizens to join in celebrating Girl Scouting by supporting these honorees and Girl Scouts of Central Texas. I witness thereof, I have unto step my hand and have caused the official seal of the city of San Angelo to be affixed this 18th day of August, 2020. Congratulations, Billy. We're so incredibly proud to have you on council and to have you continue to do the great works here in San Angelo. So congratulations. Congratulations, Billy. Thank Absolutely. you. They're all clapping, Billy. I don't know if you can see them, but everyone's clapping <laughs> and applauding you being recognized today. So thank you. Thank you. It was a, an honor and a very humbling experience. So thank you for your applause. I would also like to remind everyone that tomorrow will be the first day of school opening and many, many uh, children will be back in the classroom for the first time since the middle of March. So it tells us several things. One, we need to watch out at the crossings and be aware that there will be a slowdown due to school crossings. We haven't had that since um, the middle of March. So all of us need to slow down, watch for the kids. And most importantly, what we need to do is to make sure we continue to follow CDC guidelines. What we don't want to have happen is school start tomorrow and then have to close back down or certain classrooms have to close back down because there are positive cases in the classroom. I believe strongly that the children need to be back in the classroom. I think it's important for them to be there and uh, we need to do all we can as citizens to ensure our kids are safe, that the teachers are safe and that school can continue and help lift our, our children back up in the world of education. So let's all do our part. Thank you. With that, we will move into the consent agenda. Do I have any items from consent agenda that we are asking to be pulled? Billy? Um, thank you, Mayor. Billy DeWitt, single member district six. I would like to pull item C. Item C? Are there any other items anyone would like to pull? With none, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, ma'am. of item C, Billy has moved that we approve consent agenda. Do we have a second? I'll second. And a second by Tom Thompson. 
With that, all in favor say aye. 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 Are there any nays? With no nays, consent agenda with the exception of item C has been approved. And item C is as follows. Consider awarding NFS-02-20 Animal Adoption Services to Concho Valley Paws in the amount of $60,000 budgeted for purchase in a fiscal year 2020 with the option to extend for four additional one-year terms and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Good morning, Morgan. Good morning. Before I get to my question, I just want to say thank you for the work that you and your staff do. You know, in your calm, concise way, you inspire trust and that you have a handle on what the city needs in the way of animal services. An example of that um, was the recent um, rescue of the abused and neglected animals that was handled with such, in my opinion, in such thorough efficiency that it let the city know that we absolutely do care about the animals in our community. And I just so appreciate, Morgan, the work that you and your family do. And I wanted to say thank you. I know many times there are things that go on in the city um, that I may not express my thanks and I'm going to try to do better about that. But I did want to say um, thank you for what you're doing. You do inspire that trust and uh, you just take good care of us. So thank you. Um, my question is, when I looked at that contract, uh, the five-year contract, I noticed that in year one, everything stayed the same. However, in year two, um, the fee jumped for, to about 16%. And I just wanted to understand why such a huge increase because thereafter the increases per year was about 3%. So from year one to year two, um, the 16% increase, can you help me? And those that may be, the citizens of San Angelo that may be watching, if you could shed some light on that for us, I would appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to that. Just to clarify, I am Morgan Chagwoodin, Assistant Director of Neighborhood and Family Services. Uh, we did go out for bid um, earlier in 2020 uh, to continue our animal adoption services, uh, but with a few changes to the contract uh, to be more flexible for the vendor and to further the American Pets Alive initiative, which we have adopted. Um, it was originally submitted by um, the one vendor, Contra Valley Paws, with a significant contract fee increase from $60,000 a year to $96,000 a year, about a 60% increase uh, beginning in year one and continuing on. As we had conversations um, with the single uh, vendor that submitted, uh, we stated that um, the economic climate for the city for fiscal year 21, the budget that um, we are in preparation of right now is very bleak and to be able to fund such an increase uh, would be difficult to do. Uh, so we discussed that with Concho Valley Paws and they said we would be happy to uh, postpone any increase until October 1st, 2021, which is something that would be considered in the fiscal year 22 budget so that we can give that relief uh, to the city so no increase would happen in the budget that um, we're about to adopt. We also discussed that the contract fee increase was significant, but we did value uh, the partnership and the uh, resources that um, this partnership yields. So we said, can we offer you a smaller um, increase? Um, and th just the methodology behind developing that number uh, we said, you know, we first contracted with Contra Valley Paws in 2017 through a competitive process like this, an RFP, and I don't think that we uh, predicted that this would be a long-term um, agreement. It was just a one-year term, um, and if we had predicted that it was a long-term agreement, we might have um, adopted an escalation clause in there that each year um, some increase would be considered or built into the contract. Um, so using that methodology, I went back to the 2017 original contract price of $60,000. Um, 
and applied a 3% escalation onto 18, 19, 20, 21, and then into fiscal year 22. So the contract fee increasing to $69,556 for fiscal year 22 of the contract is a 3% escalation applied across those years. Then moving beyond into, if both parties are agreeable to continued renewals, year three of the agreement would be a 3% escalation of that $69,000 and beyond for a possible total of five years of the contract. Okay, all right. Um, that's good, Morgan. I'm sorry, did I speak over something? Something's I don't know what's going on, but there's something in the background on someone's phone, I think, on someone's computer that's creating a problem when you talk, Billy. Um, do you think it's me or can you hear you're me? Good. Okay? I don't know, you're good now, so keep talking. Okay, um, Morgan, thank you. And I think that was a, you know, a good way to go about it, to look at um, perhaps the increase that hadn't occurred over those other years. So um, I'm satisfied with that answer. Um, and I noticed in the contract, we were going to be transferring some other services to them. Are they going to need additional staff to cover that? No, oh, ma'am, they will not need additional staff. Um, one of the things that Concho Valley Paws already does, um, but we're still involved in, that just creates more work for both parties, is that uh, when an adoption is agreed upon, Concho Valley Paws staff schedules the spay, neuter, and rabies vaccine of that pet, and then the city receives that bill and pays that bill. Uh, moving forward, we wanted to assign um, the selected vendor to be the fiscal agent for adoptions, meaning that that vendor not only would set those appointments and communicate directly with the ado adopter, they would also collect any adoption fee and they can set that at whatever's appropriate for um, the market or the specific animal in question. Um, and they would um, pay the associated expense of the spay, neuter and the rabies vaccine. Right now, the fee is set by the uh, city's fee schedule resolution, and there does need to be some flexibility for uh, long stay animals, um, less adoptable animals uh, to be discounted or um, whatever the case may be. And then any associated uh, fees for this, the veterinary expenses related to that adoption um, can be offset with donated dollars or those adoption fees to handle. So the selected vendor will assume the levying and collecting of the adoption fee and will assume the duty of paying those associated services. Concha Valley Paws already has staff in place to pay um, their existing veterinary services for other items for pets in foster care, for example. So adding the um, the fees for the adopted pets will not create an undue burden on their staff. Uh, they will not require additional staff to take on that service. Okay, that answers my questions. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Mayor. Morgan, uh, I just think we ought to take an op uh, opportunity right now to say the following. The reason we have to have animal services within the city and we're working on this contract uh, was pause is because people create the problem. The city doesn't create the problem. The animals don't create the problem. It is because people choose not to take care and, and own the responsibility of taking care of the animals. And so a lot of the frustrations that we have are based off of people not taking care of their animals, which creates a problem for your organization. With that, Billy, do you want to make a motion? Well, does anybody else have a comment or question for Morgan? With none, Billy, would you like to make a motion to approve item C? Yes, Mayor, I motion that we uh, approve item C as presented. Do I have a second? Second, Mayor, Tommy Hebert, single member district one. Okay, Tommy, thank you. 
And with that, let's take a vote. All in favor of approving item C, say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? With none opposed, item C, the consent agenda is approved 7-0. Today, our agenda uh, shows that we will now move into the closed session. The executive session on the provision of government code title five, open government ethics, subtitle A, open government chapter 551, open meetings, subchapter D, exceptions to requirement that meetings be open under the following sections. A, section 551.071, consultation with attorney regarding I, contract for ES-03-20 Chadburn Street Improvements Project, uh, II, Contract for FD0120 EMS billing and receipts. III Wisner Holdings LLC DBA South Plains Lamisa Railroad item four, Ford Ranch item five, West Texas Water Partnership. And section B or B, section 551.072, deliberations about real property regarding I Wisner Holdings LLC DBA South Plains Lamisa. Railroads. So with that, we will now uh, leave the uh, city council meeting and move into closed session. I Calling the meeting back to order. And we will now do the regular agenda. Item A says consider items discussed in closed session if needed. There are none to be discussed except as we discuss um, items on the agenda. So we will move to item B. Consider ratifying a resolution approved by Coast C authorizing negotiation execution of a real estate sales contract with Wisner Holdings LLC, DBA South Plains, La Mesa Railroad, and negotiation of a real estate development performance agreement for the development, marketing, and operation of an industrial rail transloading facility necessary for economic development. And Guy, welcome back. You are on as soon as we bring you up. Guy, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I'm back. Okay, good. All right, you're on. We're ready for your presentation. Um, I guess not a presentation, we're just uh, discussing the resolution. And so does anyone have questions for Guy concerning the resolution? Tom Thompson, would you like to make a comment? Is this where I read my statement? Yes, sir. Okay. I'd like to motion to ratify the resolution approved by COSA DC authorizing the negotiation and execution of a real estate contract with Weisner Holdings LLC doing business as South Plains La Mesa Railroad and negotiation of a real estate development performance agreement for the developing marketing and operation of an industrial transloading facility with an amendment authorizing the board president to negotiate the real estate contract in conjunction with the executive director of the development corporation, the city manager or designee, the city attorney and the COSA DC attorney. Okay, but there's a motion, may I have a second? Mayor, Tommy Hebert, single member district one, I'll second that motion. All right, with that, may we take a vote? All in favor say aye. 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 None opposed, motion passes 7-0. Thank you Guy and let's <laughs> move forward and get this done. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. We'll move into item C, which is consider awarding contingent upon TxDOT concurrence ES0320 Chadburn Street Improvement Project Phase A to type that concrete incorporated in the amount of $8,892,401.87 and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Lance. You're on. Good morning, Council. Hope everyone is doing well today. I'm going to share my screen for this presentation and so that uh, you guys can see what we've got going on today. As, as you guys are aware, we have been uh, going through the process of our, our downtown Chadburn project. Uh, we have actually uh, gotten pretty close to finishing up the utility side of that project. And so we are about to move ahead with the street side of that project and some of the options that we have in front of us, as, as you guys well know, this phase A project limit is gonna basically go from the river all the way up to the intersection of Beauregard. 
Um, you can see that from, from the images that I've got on the screen, it is definitely going to be a, a very big configuration change and aesthetic change to how that downtown area looks. Um, and, and just to give you an idea of how much it's going to change, uh, you can kind of see the, the outline of what it is existing and you can see it's you know nose end parking, uh, very straight sidewalks. Uh, there are some tree tre tree wells and some um, some pavers and things like that. But it's going to undergo a very major change in terms of how that looks aesthetically, and uh, will be very pedestrian friendly as well as business friendly and parking friendly. And so we're excited about this phase A going through, and all the changes that will be represented with that change. Um, some of the other amenities that are going to be occurring is there is going to be a ramp from Chadburn um, at the river down to our river walk area, which would be a, a great transition for pedestrians and people to be able to make that change between the two as venues are going on. Uh, we also too are going to have benches along Chadburn, bike racks around Chadburn, uh, decorative lighting, uh, trash receptacles, uh, there will be designated areas for art and it's really just going to beautify that downtown area as well as take care of the streets. Um, also too that we're going to be doing reconstructing all those intersections. A lot of those aged um, traffic signals will be taken care of and replaced. Uh, as you can see the bulb outs is what we call around the intersections reduces the distance pedestrians have to be and the time they have to be in the streets. Uh, there will be ADA compliant sidewalks and pathways. Um, and, and so it's really going to change the fabric of how that downtown area looks. Um, we did uh, have a grant tied with this project and so as a part of that we were required to issue this under the state and federal requirements and regulations and so we put out an RFB. We received those bids in July uh, 24th. We had three bidders respond to that. It was FNH, Good, and Tyzak and Tyzak Concrete was the low bidder. Um, I know that a lot of us are not familiar with Tyzak, but they have done several projects here in Texas. And here's some pictures of the project. And so you can see that the, all the implements that we have as far as planters, the, the bulb outs, the nose end parking, the stained concrete, the stamped concrete, the different finishes, all of that is something that they're very familiar with and they have worked on at other projects around Texas and around the entire U.S. as a matter of fact. And so uh, they uh, also too submitted references. We followed up on all the references and everybody said that they performed well and, and within the budget. And so we are uh, asking today that you guys do move ahead with the award of that contract to Tyzak. Um, the amount of that is uh, their bid is 8.89 million. And we know that uh, we have a, a constrained budget that we will be working with to see to it that we can keep it within budget. And, uh, but Engineering Services is, is excited about being able to uh, look over this project along with our engineering firm Centurion and uh, provide this uh, great amenity to the city of San Angelo and the downtown area. Did you guys have any questions regarding the uh, process or the project or any other questions? I think you did a great job of presenting the information and it's been a project we have followed for quite some time. I'm sure most of council has had their questions answered already, but I'll open it back up for additional questions if there are any. Mayor? Yes. Tommy Hebert, single member district one. Uh, Lance, uh, when would you anticipate the uh, actual work beginning on, on the project? We are currently in, in discussions uh, with uh, Tyzak as far as schedules. Um, we have actually asked them about what their schedule might look like. Uh, we can't have a whole lot of those detailed conversations until it has been awarded as an RFB. Uh, we know that with the uh, Christmas season coming up and the importance of that to the, a lot of the downtown businesses, uh, we would probably look at maybe starting the project at the end of the Christmas season, uh, the first of the year. There, there may be some pocket areas that Tyzak uh, could get started with early enough or earlier on that would not impact those areas. For example, the ramp down by the river and some of the other things. So th a lot of that would be after the, uh, the award, we would go back to Tyzak and start having those conversations. Um, but we don't anticipate that Chadburn um, proper, the area would be impacted too much until after that Christmas holiday season because of the importance of the, of the businesses and those sales and things like that. So, 
Good. Th thank you, Lance. And may I ask, what's the time frame on this? So from beginning to end, what is the anticipated time frame? I believe, I would, Mayor, I'd have to go back and look at the RFB, but I want to say it was like 18 months is what we were giving them to take care of that. Um, it, it is far as size of area, it's only three blocks long, but it is going to be fairly invasive because we are going building face to building face. So it is going right. to be, you know, a, a pretty much a block at a time will be closed down. And, and unfortunately, because of the the construction of that with the roadway and the sidewalks and the disturbance, it will probably have quite a significant amount of detours that will be be set up for that. Uh, there will be entire blocks that will be uh, taken um, out of commission at a time. We will be working with the contractor though to see to it that there is a means to continue to access those businesses, um, but it may mean a, a half a block walk from one direction or the other to get to them it, while that project is going on. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from council? Then may I have a motion? Harry, would you like to make a motion? Thank you, Mayor. Harry Thomas, single member district three. I make a motion that we award this contract to tie that concrete. May I have a second? I'll second it with all that. May we take a vote? All in favor say aye. 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 Is, any opposed? With none opposed, motion passes seven zero. We will now move into item D, which is the update on the 2020 census complete count. And we have um, Misty Hill, I believe, here to fill us in on details. Thank you, Misty, for joining us. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for having me. I will go into sharing my screen now and begin my presentation. All right. So I am Misty Hill, the Partnership Specialist for Tom Green County and nine other counties. So far nationally, 63.4% of residents have responded. Here in Texas, 58.4% have responded. In Tom Green County specifically, 62.8% have responded. Ranking you guys- See seven. your screen, Misty. We don't see your presentation. We just still see you. Okay, one moment. Thank you. We see it now. Thank you, Ms. Dean. All right, thank you. Um, so Tom Green County is 17th out of 250 some odd counties. The city of San Angelo has responded 63.9% and is ranked 237 out of over 1200 cities. So that's wonderful. And you guys have consistently been there throughout the launch of the census in mid-March. Can you explain the, Misty why it's so important for people to respond? Absolutely. So um, representation for the next 10 years and most importantly, federal funding to communities for the next 10 years is dependent on the count that we're doing right now. So um, getting people to self-respond gets us more accurate data versus when we have to send out the door knockers to collect the data. Um, so we wanna make sure to get a count everyone once, only once and in the right place there in um, San Angelo for the purposes of representation and of funding. The only two areas of concern really um, as the count stands right now are these two parts of town. This part of town is 50% Hispanic, which falls under the umbrella of hard to count. So we do have special initiatives that we're utilizing to reach this population. Something unique about this specific part of town is that um, of the people that have responded, only 50% have responded online. So our outreach efforts there will be focused on making sure folks mail in the questionnaire that they received or that they call in because it seems like that particular community isn't fond of responding online. This other part of town is the base. And so we're not concerned about that because they're being counted in a special side of the operation and we're confident that we'll get a complete count on that particular um, part of San Angelo. As I mentioned, there are several different ways folks can respond. 
to the 2020 census. The preferred method this year is the first census that we've offered it online. And they, residents can go to 2020census.gov on their smartphone, iPad, or computer, um, or they can respond by phone calling 88, um, forgive me, 844-330-2020, or they can respond by mail, which means they would complete and return the packets they received in the mail or just on their doorstep, send that in. If a household doesn't respond in one of those three ways, we will send out a census door knocker. And it's important that you guys know, um, and we'll let your local law enforcement know that these folks could be out as soon as right now. So we've already started sending the door knockers out in the community and they can be identified by these census bags that the woman in this photo is wearing. And they will also be wearing a census badge. They will have PPE and masks on. And um, that can, that's happening right now. And we're still hiring folks to go out into San Angelo and do that work. The reasoning for San Angelo having such a wonderful, you know, you guys have had a very successful census thus far, and um, we're going to credit your two complete count committees there in San Angelo, um, one headed up by the NAACP and Ms. Shirley Spears, and the other committee was put together um, on behalf of the city by Bob Solace. And um, both of these committees have been very active from the beginning of our operations and prior to that, getting the training, getting the word out to the right people of influence there in San Angelo. Also, um, not related to complete count committee work, the um, Methodist Healthcare Ministries organization has done a lot of work that's benefited the census, as have the United Way and Aaron over at Bethel um, Baptist Church. If anyone has questions about the 2020 census, here's my contact information. Um, otherwise, I'm open to answering any of your questions. Do I have any questions for Misty from council? I see none. So Misty, thank you. Keep up the work. We want to make sure everyone gets counted. It's pretty important to um, San Angelo and to our region in terms of maintaining our representation um, in Congress. So thank you. All right, we will move on to the next item, which is item E. Consider accepting the recommendation of the San Angelo Airport Advisory Board to approve the final airport master plan and airport layout plan developed by Centurion Planning and Design and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Jeremy, you're on. Good morning, Mayor, uh, Council staff, Jeremy Valgartson representing the San Angelo Airport. I appreciate you having me on today. This is a very exciting day for the airport. As you know, we tasked Centurion Planning and Design to doing the master plan about two years ago. Um, and really what we we're looking for is a good defendable document that we could take to the FAA and, and help us to compete um, for federal grants. So happy to say that the final draft of the master plan is complete. Um, it's been through several processes. It's gone through the planning advisory committees, uh, the technical advisory committees, and also through several public meetings where we got as much data as we could um, to put into the plan and to, to justify its cause. Um, really the, the intent of the master plan is to get as much federal money as we can, to compete for as much federal money as we can, but then to also show the, the needs, both current needs and future needs of the community and, and how that airport can play a role into those needs. Um, a lot of the plan that you're going to see, a lot of the drafting that you're going to see is, is driven through FAA standards. Um, one point in case would be the runway. It's a big project and it's an, our airport is an old military airport. It's been designed with old military technology and we really need to, to catch up to the current FAA design standards. So, so you're going to see a lot of that in the plan as you read through it. Um, for the public to know the master plan is on our website. You can look just on the airport's main page, it's right there on the very front. You can see all five um, pages of the draft master plan. Um, it's exciting to have this document in hand. It's really gonna help us to promote the airport. Um, I know you, you sat through a, a conversation a little while ago about planes, trains, and automobiles, and, and that's really been the city's focus. And I think the timing is great to have the master plan done where we can compete for federal money and show that need in our community. And, and it'll position ourselves well for, for future growth of commercial aviation, business aircraft, general aviation, 
industrial and manufacturing. So I won't steal any of Molly's thunder. Molly with Centurion Planning Design is on and she will give us a brief presentation. You're muted, Molly. Thank you. There you go. Good morning, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen. We do have a brief presentation to show today. All right. Um, do you see the big screen or the little screen? The, we, the little screen needs to be bigger and the big screen needs to be littler. Okay, I'm gonna do this. There we go. All right, it's good to be here today. Um, I know I've spoken with all of you in the past, but I just wanted to refresh real quick. What is an airport master plan? Um, it's essentially a planning process. It takes one to two years um, to plan for short, intermediate, and long-term airport facility needs. Um, as Jeremy indicated, it was prepared in accordance with FAA industry standards, and it results in a phase development plan and a CIP for the airport. Um, San Angelo's last master plan was done in, I believe, 1994. So it was time for an update. Um, the FAA is regularly releasing new design standards and new things need to be done at airports. So this provided a great opportunity to eva evaluate all of FAA's new standards and put together a demand-based plan. So essentially the city knows where to put things when opportunities come to the airport. There were four key milestones. The first was inventory and forecast where we looked at what's currently at the airport, the current users of the airport and how the airport may grow in the future from both a general aviation, a business and industry and a commercial service standpoint. We then looked at facility requirements, what kind of facilities would be needed to meet that anticipated demand and alternatives. We then put together a recommended development concept, which again is the 20 year plan. It's a little overwhelming when you look at it at first, but you're not gonna build everything at once. It will be demand based. Um, that development concept is then placed on what's called an airport layout plan set. And this is what the FAA will actually approve. And by approving the conditionally approving your ALP, it makes it those projects that are eligible for financial funding um, able to be put into your capital improvement program. <clears throat> we did do quite a bit of stakeholder outreach. We had a planning and a technical advisory committee for the preparation of this master plan. They met at four key points during the planning process. Um, again, that, that went in line with the inventory, the forecast, the facility requirements, alternatives, and the recommended development concept and financials. We also had three public meetings, which were very well attended. Um, the last one we had was in November 2019. Um, again, these were held at key times to make sure that the city, the, the residents of the city and the community were involved in this planning process. As far as the, the findings and recommendations overall, we did find that there are some airfield improvements that are necessary to meet the FA runway and taxiway design standards. You'll see that in some exhibits that are coming up. There is a, an immediate need for additional hangar storage facilities for larger aircraft. Um, so we have quite a bit of hangers planned on these, these exhibits you're gonna be seeing. We also did an evaluation of the commercial service terminal. Your previous airport layout plan had a terminal uh, location that was essentially between your two runways. And it set aside some space that may be necessary for business or industrial development. So what we did as part of the master plan is we looked at your current terminal facility. We did forecast of employments and commercial service activity assuming um, one airline, two airlines, the continuing of what you currently have. And we essentially found that the current location of the terminal with some slight expansion would be able to accommodate the ultimate 20 year demand from the master plan. So what we did was we, we planned for a future commercial terminal essentially on the opposite side of the runway, freeing up the area that was previously planned for industrial or business development. And then finally, we identified some revenue enhancing opportunities, some ways that maybe the airport could generate some revenue that aren't currently being utilized. This is, as I indicated, the recommended development concept. This is the development that is shown on your airport layout plan set. Um, we're gonna walk through it uh, quickly now, focusing on some specific areas. As I indicated, when we started this master plan, there was a need for hangars. There were folks that wanted to build hangars at the airport. So one of the very first things that we did was we looked at your airfield to see where could someone put a hangar today. And these are the areas where someone could go build a hangar today. There's not all that much space. There are some of these that would require some apron development in order to accommodate a hangar growth. 
Um, right over here where my mouse is, that's where the paint facilities are. If you wanted to increase that, you have some space for some hangers across from the paint facilities. But long story short, there was not a lot of space today where you could go build a hangar. That then takes us into the short-term development. So we wanted to look at the short-term development and see, in addition to the spaces we have today, what are some improvements that could be undertaken that would allow for some additional hangers? So I'm gonna start right here with this long blue line, which is labeled A1. This is your current runway 927. Sorry, my mouse is not moving. Uh, the city council decided a couple, a few years back that because the FA would not support the funding of the maintenance and the rehabilitation of this runway, that it was to be closed. Um, so the A1 project is the conversion of the current runway 927 to a taxiway. What that does is it opens up quite a bit of space for apron. I apologize, I don't know why my mouse is not working. There. Okay. The closure of runway 927 allows for the development of this large apron space. Currently, this apron area is, contain is contained within the runway 927 runway protection zone. So by constructing that apron space, it allows for a taxi lane to be constructed down for some hangars. Moving further down the airfield, this is what is referred to as a big GTE hangar. It requires extensive modifications. Um, to be occupied. So we propose possibly tearing that building down. You would then construct some apron and there's some space for four additional hangars. Continuing down the airfield in the short term again, this is where the airport's current T hangar units are. They're also aging. And so we included a plan to remove three of those T hangar units, replace them down here, and then construct some nicer, larger hangars um, in the midfield of your current apron. And then again, moving down the airfield, these are again for the smaller aircraft at this end of the airport. This final project at the end of the apron is a, a self-serve fuel farm. In talking to some of the general aviation pilots at the airport, we found that they would like to possibly be able to fuel their own aircraft, um, the smaller guys. And so we did put a space in there for a self-serve fuel farm. Moving on to the intermediate term development, this is where we really start to focus in on the runway and taxiway projects that are necessary to meet FAA design standards. Currently, the runway protection zone for runway 1836 extends over Knickerbocker Road. And you also have displaced thresholds because of runway safety area <clears throat> limitations. So what we've done is we've shifted runway 1836 to meet those runway safety area requirements, proposed additional connecting taxiways, and we're replacing the pavement that's lost at the other end of the airport. The other project on runway 321 is to what we, can, what we call decouple the runway ends. Currently, get to the runway 3 end, you have to taxi across taxiway F. And the FAA does not consider that to be the safest of operating environments, and so we are extending runway 321 um, to decouple those runway ends. At the same time, we did a wind and weather analysis, and we found that runway 1836 is actually the best runway to be used during inclement weather. So as part of this runway 321 runway extension, we'd be relocating the instrument landing system to runway 1836. Um, it makes the most sense. This is your primary runway. It's adjacent to the apron. And so these are really the projects down at this end of the runway that we included in the intermediate term. These are the types of projects that compete well for FAA funding. So the reason they're pushed out into the intermediate term, um, which is essentially five to 10 years, is to allow the FAA to appropriately program for that. You will see in the intermediate term, we also have some additional hangar development that was occurring. Um, over here between the runways, this is the, the, the previous plan had the commercial service terminal. We put something over here, this could be a flight school, this could be an MRO, this could be something else other than the commercial service terminal because again, we didn't identify a need for that within this planning horizon. Everything you see in gray on this exhibit was included in the short-term plan. One thing I wanted to point out is you'll see your air side is all full through this intermediate term. And so we wanted to look at the back side of the airport and the intermediate term we're starting that project where we would dead end hangar road. This would allow us to replace some additional T hangar units down here and start the, start the plan for the development of the backside of the airport over here. 
Moving into the long term, this is the 10 to 20 year horizon. This is all the way out there. I'm going to start at the top of the exhibit with L23. This is the area that we are recommending be set aside for a commercial service terminal. And the reason for that is, as Jeremy alluded to, planes, trains, and automobiles. If the interstate, and when the interstate comes through San Angelo, it's up on this side of the city. So we wanted to make sure that you're gonna have good access to your commercial service terminal from the proposed interstate route. So this area up here would be where we would recommend you put that commercial service terminal. To accommodate that, we're gonna need a parallel taxiway on runway 321. We did some additional shifts up runway 1836 to fully meet FA's runway protection zone guidance in the long-term plan. And then again, we continued the hangar development on the opposite side of the airport. It's important, and you'll see as we were planning these projects, it's always important that you, when you put a hangar, you put a facility at the airport, you look at what's coming next. So for example, if we would have put up a hangar down here where my mouse is, it would have limited the access to the back side of the airport. So our recommendation of airport planners is that you rely on this master plan when people want to come develop on the land side to make sure that you're not impeding future development at your airport. Finally, we looked at your existing airport revenue sources um, because again, you want to find out how can you pay for everything in this master plan. Currently, the airport uh, obtains revenue from airlines, the restaurants, concessions, your rental car revenue, your leases, fuel flowage fees, landing fees, all those things that Jeremy collects that help on the day-to-day -day operation of the airport. As part of the airport mass plan, we did identify some potential new airport revenue sources. Again, this would be through new hangar and ground leases in those areas where we noted you could put hangars. Automobile parking. Um, if the city would opt to choose for automobile parking, that's not a revenue that is currently being collected. We looked at what's called a rental car customer facility charge or a CFC. This is also not currently collected. Essentially what a CFC is, is that there's additional funds that are passed through the rental car companies for every day someone rents a car. So for example, at Abilene Airport, they have a CFC where they collect, I believe, $5 a day. I might not be correct on the number, but they collect a certain amount of money per day as a CFC. That again, that's paid for not by the rental car company, but it's paid for by the person renting the car. That's another revenue source that may be available. We also looked at some shared facilities that could increase possibly revenue at the airport. Those would be some like a consolidated fuel farm, the GA self-serve, which I noted earlier, or a consolidated quick turnaround facility. This is essentially where you take rental cars to get vacuumed and cleaned up ahead of the next uh, renter. Currently, you have two smaller QTA facilities at the airport. We would suggest consolidating that into one, and again, it could potentially turn into a future revenue source. So as far as the next steps, the next steps are um, if City Council adopts the, the master plan today, we will submit the ALP to the F FAA uh, for review, comment, and approval. They will route it through their various lines of business, airspace, airports, all those folks, make sure everybody agrees with what's in there, and then they will conditionally approve your ALP. And again, as Jeremy indicated, that is what makes your projects eligible for potential funding in the future um, for eligible projects. So I ran through that kind of quickly. Um, if you have any questions, Jeremy and I are both available to answer questions. Tom. Here I have just one comment, Harry Thomas, single member district three. This is a very comprehensive plan. I certainly appreciate uh, Centurion uh, doing this and congratulations to Molly and to Jeremy on this plan. I think it's something that will allow us to move forward and receive some federal funding from the FAA and possibly some interest from some other uh, businesses that want to relocate. So thank you very much. Tom Thompson. Hey Molly, when you were looking, they were going to move the ILS over to the 1836, are you still going to leave it on 321? Are we going to have two ILS's approaches or just one? You will just have the one. Um, because we would have to do the, the pavement, the mouths are in pavement on runway 321. We removed from runway 321 and be placed on runway 1836. Okay. So with the pending flight school, I mean, is that something we should look at maybe making an adjustment for? If we were to get a flight school, wouldn't they want two runways for an ILS or am I just reading too much into it? 
Um, right now, I think so, Tom. What I do know is talking to Scott Wisnowski, what they are going to be doing is using the skyline um, building at this point, their, their hangar space for this flight school. And so unlike where they originally had thought about using the GTE hangar, that is no longer in their thought process. And so it moves from one end of the airport down to the other end of the airport. And I'll just add, because of the current runway configurations where you have essentially conflicting runways, your airport only operates one runway at a time. And so right. it's a single runway airport. So that flight school is just gonna operate on whatever runway is available. Um, so if they need to do instrument training, actually putting that ILS on one eight three six means it is going to be available for those smaller aircraft more often than it would be available if it was on runway three two one. Runway one eight three six has that predominant wind during those weather events that require the use of the ILS. But for training purposes, you only utilize one runway at a time at your airport. All right, thank you, Molly. Welcome. A question relative to plan, uh, applying for grants. I know at one point we had a grant, I believe it was for half a million dollars to try to attract another airline of which at that point in time, and Jeremy, you'll probably want to answer this. So come on, I guess you're on. But all right, so we never, we were not able to find an airline who would support uh, bringing service to San Angelo out of the fear that the $500,000 wouldn't begin to cover their costs of operations, so we were turned down. But once we no longer, once we did not find an operator to use those funds for, what does that do in impacting us for applying for that same kind of a grant going forward? Are we in trouble because we applied for it, we got it, and we never used it, so they're not gonna consider us again if we apply for that? type of a grant, just like Abilene got their $1.2 million, which was the attraction that brought Sky West to Abilene and not to San Angelo, uh, because we didn't have that grant. And I think the grant time frame had ended on that half a million dollars. Yeah, Mayor, and, and I, I wouldn't say we're in trouble. That grant is very specific to that route. Um, so we cannot apply for another route to San Angelo, or excuse me, to Houston from San Angelo for another 10 years. And I think we signed our last extension in 2016. Um, so we're not looking for another Houston route for 2026 as far as a government incentive. Um, however, we can apply for another airport or for another route. And with the, the regionals moving to the 175, there's some other airports that may be within our reach and some other markets such as Phoenix or Denver. And, and I would have to consult with, with Molly on that, but Houston is probably out of the question unless the secretary is going to give us an amendment or a waiver on it, but we can research um, other routes. Can we ask for that amendment? Because obviously the number one requested route from San Angelo happens to be Houston. So I don't believe anyone on council knew that, and it was before most of our time. So it's not something that we, this council would have had an opportunity to have a voice on, but I was not aware that in fact, when that grant ended and we didn't utilize it, that there was a 10 year penalty, if you will, uh, before you could reapply. And I'm, I'm, there could be a couple people who were on council, but were not aware, of course, what the, the implications on that were. So we're kind of in the you know, lack of knowledge bucket. Mayor, I think uh, Lucy and Harry and I were on, and I was not aware of a 10-year turnaround on that either. That's what I thought. Thank you for- I wasn't either, Mayor. Lucy, what did you say? I said I wasn't aware of that either. Yeah, and I think, and, and again, it's no one's fault. I wanna make sure we're clear because obviously no airline said we're interested. We couldn't entice anyone. So regardless of that, it's not something that we can change could have changed the dynamics of it, but I just think we need to be honest and upfront with that with the citizens of San Angelo because they keep asking for a route to Houston and none of us realized until Jeremy just explained it that we're off the limits for till 2026 to apply for a grant to a Houston route. I was not aware of that. I, if, yeah. This is Molly, I might add, I was involved a little bit in that process back when you had the SCASD grant. And the one thing that happened during that time, it was very unfortunate. It was the industry timing. 
when San Angelo had that grant previously, oil and gas was booming. It was ahead of the, the fall, I believe, in 2014, 2015. Um, so that worked against the other thing that was really in the hands was the, the merger of some airlines back then. That's when United and Continental merged. And so the expansion, especially to the Houston rounds, wasn't happening at that point in time. So unfortunately, you were impacted by some industry events back in, in those days. Um, the one thing that I'd point out from some, what, what some other communities do is I wouldn't hesitate to apply for another route. If you were to get a United, United serviced both Phoenix and um, Denver. And if they came to San Angelo with those two markets, that doesn't mean they wouldn't introduce a Houston. Um, so understanding the city has wanted a Houston route for a very long time. There is some connectivity with some of these airlines that if you would get a Denver route with a SCASD grant, since they're here, they may go ahead and add a different route. I just wanted to add that. Well, I think we certainly want to apply for whatever grants are out there that we think are reasonable. But again, we don't want to apply for one and get penalized like we did on this Houston route and then find we are penalized 10 years further down the road for other routes. So I think we need to be very cautious in terms of what we do apply for if there's penalties and where we can't deliver on that grant application and, you know, again, penalize the city of San Angelo for future development in terms of rail, um, airline service. So that number one. Then the number two thing I want to ask, because you brought it up, Molly, is one of the things that other airline, other cities do, and the reality is, is the citizens who, local citizens who use our airline are not impacted by this, and that is the rental car fee. That is a fee that most airports charge. It is a revenue service. If if Brenda Gunter flies out of San Angelo and never rents a car, it doesn't cost me anything. But if I go to Colorado Springs and rent a car, I'm gonna pay that fee at Colorado Springs. And many people who travel here are on business and because they are on business, their companies are used to that fee already being attached to a rental car. So I would think that right now, whether we, I'm not saying we have to do it today, but I think that's something that this council should seriously consider as a revenue source is that car rental fee. And that's, it's not a, you know, we're not gonna have a motion on that, but it's certainly something I would ask each of you to look at and think about and ask questions about it uh, for future potential revenue source. Um, do I, yes, Tommy. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, Tommy Hebert, single member district one. Go, following up there, uh, maybe zooming out a little bit, uh, Molly, on, on, on the mayor's question, maybe making it a bigger question. Are there things that the city of San Angelo can do to maybe kickstart some things that may be, I'll, I'll say almost ready right now, but we may just need a little oomph to kind of get it going? Are, are there some big picture things that we can do or at least consider doing that might get, give us uh, some um, momentum? And so I'll turn it over to Jeremy because he's at the airport um, every day. I'm going to okay. give kind of a broader perspective what other airports do. Um, I showed the exhibit and if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen again and show you an exhibit. Give me one second. It's not as easy as it is when you're in council chambers. And I'm going to just skip down to this immediate development slide. When you look at the space that's available, is it sharing? It is not. Again. Okay. Well, it's not going to work if I go with the big screen. We do it on the little one. We're okay. Okay. Let's see if this works. Oh my goodness. Let me try one more time and then I will share this screen. 
Okay, I'm not going to try to maximize it. I hope you can see it. This is your exhibit with your immediate development areas and Councilman Hebert, what I would point out to you is right now, there is one site on your airport where someone could go build a hangar without the need for apron or without the need of any form of access. All of the rest of these sites require some form of apron construction in order to build the hangar. So when you look at what other airports are doing, what they're doing is they're, they're getting some sites that are ready for development. So I will hop down to this area, for example. This is where your GTE hangar is. That's a hangar that have, you've been trying to get a big tenant in there for a long time. And because of its location, some of the work that needs to be done, it's been a little bit prohibitive. So maybe preparing this site for some hangar development or possibly relocating some T hangar units. This would be a more costly project. Um, but again, opening up some more space to allow for some of these hangars to be developed, um, essentially shovel-ready sites, so to speak. So again, right now, the airport does not have a lot of what I would call shovel-ready sites. Um, you just have these, and those even need a little bit of apron. Um, if you went in and made some of these shovel-ready, that's what some, what some other airports do um, to just for some development. Jeremy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Well, I think you had a list, you had a page, Molly, that listed all potential opportunities. It wasn't the pictures and the graphs and whatever, it was line item by line item, some of our revenue opportunities. And I think that's the screen and we don't have to pull it up now, but I think it is, and I go back to Jeremy. These are things, Jeremy, I'd like you to look at and, and bring back to council at some future time the next month, two months, in terms of us discussing what some of those potential revenue ideas are, such as the rental car fee, which I think 99% of airports charge. We're just still not in that uh, business. But I think there's things that we can do to, to immediately start to impact some revenue opportunities so that if we do need to build some aprons, for future hangar development, we have a source of revenue to help pay for some of those aprons so that we can do, and I know there's um, people out there who really want some additional hangers. So there are things that we can do to help make these opportunities happen. Right, and and Mayor, we, we have taken this to airport board and they have made a recommendation to bring to city council um, this all happened right before COVID hit, and then we were we were kind of on halt with the fees. So we'll be coming to you soon with um, some possible fee increases for those. Um, and the other thing I may say is, as far as air service development goes, um, I'm, I'm if that's the direction council wants to take it, I'm happy to ask the secretary for for a waiver on that um, ten year requirement. Um, but I also would say that I've been talking to I'm always we're always talking to airlines, as you know. We went to Chicago and talked to United. Um, we're always talking to airlines and with the data we got from the master plan that shows our leakage and the, the opportunities here for an airline to come in to make some serious money out of San Angelo is there. Um, so we, we, an incentive is nice to have, um, but we also want to continue to pitch to the airlines that they can come run an at-risk flight and still be profitable in San Angelo. So we do have the demand, we have the need, and I think um, hopefully soon we'll be offering that service without the government incentive which would be great. My big concern right now is that with Babylon getting uh, the Houston route, we'll have a bigger leakage from San Angelo to Abilene now uh, because of that Houston route. And I'm nervous that the numbers that we look at today will be impacted by that because we know that's the number one request by citizens of San Angelo is the Houston route. And I'm very nervous that um, it's going to have a negative impact on our flights. And right. we'll see what time that happens. Okay. Jeremy, I would say just as one member of the council, if you can challenge our thinking and, and come up with some things that we may be able to do, uh, if the city, uh, let's just call it, it, it may be an investment. Um, and sometimes you have to invest to, uh, to uh, be able to, to grow some things. So don't, uh, as one council member, don't be afraid to challenge me with some opportunities that you may foresee out there that, that could help us um, address really what the mayor just said. So um, I, I would encourage you and the airport board to say, you know, here's some things we could do. It, you may cost, you know, may cost some money. You may have to invest, but here's what it will yield. So 
if, to get things going, uh, please, please don't hesitate to do that. Lane, I see your mute coming on and off. Did you want to make a comment? I didn't see your hand raised, but didn't know if you were trying to make a comment. I am. I was just waiting for the right time. Uh, it's from Molly. A question for you on an average turnaround time once this is submitted for review um what what have you seen in the past for a project like this in the past we've seen as short as two months unfortunately COVID's hitting and everyone's working remotely so you're very fortunate you've got marcino sanchez as your program manager and jeremy and marcino have a great relationship so we'll expedite as much as we can but i will say with everyone working remotely things have slowed down at the fa review process well, the other thing I want to say is, you know, we've talked about the grants that support adding flights, but Jeremy, I know you're very well versed in grants that exist or will exist for some of the development of these projects that we um, now see that we will need to do or want to do with this master plan. So one is, is grants for improvement of the airport and two is grants applicable to trying to secure an additional airline. So they're two separate things. We need to be working on both areas um, to really continue to make this airport the big economic driver that it can be, it has the potential to be. Right, and, and maybe another maybe. question for uh, Jeremy. Go ahead, Lane, go ahead. Do we have any kind of a project going where um, private aircraft owners who use hangar space and they're in the local areas, Midland, Odessa, um, but a lot of times they'll fly here. Are we approaching them to see if they would like to relocate their, um, their aircraft here in the additional hangar space that we're potentially going to build? Yeah, we have. We did that actually early in this process. Um, we talked to some of those businesses because their aircraft are sitting out on our ramp with, with no hangar space to park. Um, they're not, based here but they would be based here if they had hangar space um, so we, we've had a lot of those conversations with some of those business and also some businesses that are talking about doing some um, some development some manufacturing some some testing so we, we've talked to them we've, we've showed them and actually molly's been great and showed them the draft of the master plan and said here's some potential here's opportunities to come to san angelo um, and we've also worked with economic development a little bit on opening up some of those areas so that, that conversation has been had, and that's a lot of where the data came from in the master plan to justify those needs. Okay. And is any of this master plan a holdup majorly for the ASU flight school? Are they waiting on us for anything, or they can they start at this point? They, they cannot start at this point in time because it has not been approved by the legislatures for the funding that is needed for ASU. It is past right, the region, so we have until it's approved for, ready to go. Yeah, we, we can't. It's no, it's not there. If they were good on their end, we have to be on good on our end and we're not at that point. No, sir. Right. And, and, and that is a good question because oftentimes the FAA does require the airports to go through an environmental assessment before they allow a, a, an industry like that to come in, which could be a two year process. But we, we cleared that with the FAA. We're, we're good to go when ASU is ready to open their doors. Okay, any further questions for Jeremy or Molly? If not, thank you for this presentation. And we look forward to continuing the conversation on the Mayor? opportunities at the airport. Yes, Tommy. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, we need to, um, I, I would like to make a motion to accept the recommendation of the airport advisory board uh, to approve the uh, final airport master plan and the uh, airport layout plan. I'll yes, second. Thank you, Tommy, and then seconded by Lane. Would all in favor um, say aye? aye? Aye. All right, with none opposed, motion passes 7 0. And thank you for all the great work. And let's get going on this economic development opportunity. All right, on, we'll move on to item F consider resolution allowing the suspension of certain ordinance requirements regarding parking, right of way encroachments, and signage during the statewide issue disaster declaration related to the COVID 19 pandemic. And Leslie Jones, you're on with that. Do I read my public? I'm sorry. Uh, we have John James on for that. Do I read my public? Okay. The first thing we want to do is start this item off with a, a public comment. And the public comment is as follows. 
Twin Peaks restaurants would like to voice our support for agenda item number 7F, allowing the suspension of certain ordinance requirements regarding parking, right-of-way encroachments, and signage during the statewide issue disaster declaration related to COVID-19. In particularly, allowing restaurants to take advantage of outdoor seating and designated parking and or sidewalk areas on private property while COVID-19 indoor dining capacity restrictions remain in place. We are submitting the attached outdoor seating plan proposal in support of our request. Adopting this item would help increase revenues for both businesses and the city and would also allow additional employees to return to work due to increased capacity. Thank you for your kind consideration. All right, John, you're on. Thank you. Uh, as you may recall, this is the item that uh, we talked about at the last meeting. Uh, we made some changes based on your direction. Um, it, so the couple things we did, we, we kept the suspension related to private parking lots and the changes uh, regarding signage. Um, we did remove the uh, suspension that would be related to the public right of way uh, for streets and sidewalks. So um, while it would still be possible to do something in the street or a sidewalk, uh, that would require uh, a request to come before city council uh, rather than being uh, eligible for administrative approval. No, I think, John, we were saying we did not even want to consider that. No, that's not right. We did not say that. Yeah, that, that's always been an option. I mean, in, anytime anybody wants to do something in the street, they can always ask city council uh, for that. that. That's not a change. Um, and so th this would not change the current practice uh, for someone wanting to put you know, we have a couple of restaurants, for example, that do have seating areas downtown, uh, but they had to come to city council to get approval for that, uh, or a street closure for a, a, you know, a parade or an event um, also is the same process that would come to city council. The other thing we did, um, well, let me step back. The, uh, as I mentioned, it what this does is remove the requirement for city council approval for those first two items that I mentioned. Um, but uh, anyone wishing to do this would still have to submit plans to staff where we would review compliance with things like uh, ADA uh, compliance, making sure that emergency vehicles should, could still access a site and those sorts of things. Uh, one change I did want to mention, we did make a change. Uh, the original proposal was that this would be effective as long as occupancy limits are in place for a retail or restaurant or a disaster declaration was in place, even if the occupancy limits go away. Uh, we've taken out that disaster declaration, but staff is still recommending that we include that back in. And the thinking there is, uh, it, let's say that occupancy limits are removed and restaurants or businesses can go back to full occupancy there may be some businesses that want to continue with the reduced occupancy. Uh, we know we have some chain restaurants, for example, uh, some of whom still don't have in, uh, in restaurant dining because their corporate national uh, policy is to not reopen yet. Uh, so similarly, some of these restaurants could have limits on occupancy uh, either by their choice or placed on them by their, uh, you know, their national companies. And so, uh, even if the legal occupancy limits are reduced, we'd like to keep this in place as long as there's a pan pandemic uh, declaration uh, to allow that flexibility for those restaurants to continue. Uh, again, I, I didn't go through the whole presentation from last time, but this really was uh, meant to uh, indicate the changes uh, from what you had seen previously. Uh, that I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do I have questions from council? Number one, well, I have comments. I think it needs to be left as long as occupancy limits, not the disaster declarations. So that's what we said last time. I think it still applies. So it's based off of occupancy limits um, because in fact, they can come and ask for that anytime anyway, as you just said. So it needs to be effective as long as occupancy limits are in place, period. Well, let, let me address that real quick. Um, the ability to use parking lots for uh, things like this, for retail or uh, for uh, outdoor seating, those kinds of things, that is not something that can currently under our current ordinances come before city council. Our ordinances basically set a required amount of parking 
that they have to use for parking and can't use for other things. And so if, uh, if this goes away because occupancy limits go away, uh, we currently have no other uh, option for those restaurants that might want to continue doing this for some time. And you time. need to bring the ordinance back to us. It shouldn't be covered under this. But not this ordinance. Harry? I did, just question here, is this particular ordinance needs to come back or do we have another ordinance that, that John's talking about? So I just want clarification so I make sure that I understand which one we're, we're looking at here. Yes, because what he says is the current ordinance, not this one, but one that's already in place does not allow anybody to use parking for outdoor dining. And so the issue would be if we think that's the right thing in normal day in and day out basis, then that should be re-looked at as the ordinance in place that restricts that, not using an ordinance suspension one to address it. Ms. Harry, I'd like to, this is Teresa Jones, city attorney. This is just a resolution that's suspending portions of our current ordinance. It's not actually an ordinance change today. That's the point. Okay, so effective and, as long as occupancy limits are in place. And I would add that staff's position is, is that we would not necessarily be in favor of uh, the ability of, of restaurants or retail to do this uh, anytime because there is a reason we have those parking requirements. And in fact, you may recall, we just reduced those parking requirements in that ordinance recently. Um, but we, we really are only supportive of this during this time where restaurants and retail are, are facing uh, issues that aren't uh, typical. Uh, and so again, that it, it's only this time that we're in right now uh, that we're supportive of allowing them to encroach out into those parking areas. And again, I think it's wrong. I think if, as long as the occupant, because then really what you're saying is if you leave it and you do as staff is recommended, which I don't support, someone could have 125% occupancy by use of their parking lot at the same time using 100% occupancy inside, because that's what you're asking us to do. And I don't think that's right. If they're allowed 100% occupancy, no, that's, that's a good point. I think uh, one thing we, we could do is uh, if we kept the disaster declaration piece in place, we could say, but in no case can they exceed 100% of their indoor occupancy or something like that. Which is great, John, but you know what the problem with all of that is? Who enforces it? Nobody. And that's been the problem with all of these all along is nobody enforces it. We put it out there. And then the police department, because they have plenty of other things to do, don't want to be the people who enforce it. TABC doesn't want to enforce it. Code, code, code enforcement doesn't want to enforce it. So no, it should be effective as long as occupancy limits are in place. We can't keep creating these problems that no one has the ability to enforce. Okay, we can definitely move forward that way. With that, is there, are there any, go back to the first screen. Okay, so the signage we all were very supportive of using uh, private parking lots. Um, again, I don't believe we want, you know, there's the statistics are out there. Um, and really when you say streets and sidewalks, you're, you're really referring to downtown, not any other area of town. And right now, I don't think there should be anything even in here for council to approve during this ordinance suspension conversation because the amount of accidents, and it's well documented right now, those cities allowing streets, particularly the incident accident rate has, has gone up fourfold. And we don't have wide enough sidewalks downtown to allow for ADA and those people who already have permits to use their sidewalks have had to pay for that ride. So for me, it's eliminate the removed suspension related to public right of way. Well, that, that just means that we took that completely out. So the resolution that's before you today doesn't mention the public right of way at all. All of that language was taken out of the resolution based on y'all's direction last time. All right, then I move to approve based off of 
uh, elimination of the item on the next page. Harry Thomas, I my district three, I, I second that motion. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 None opposed, motion passes 7-0. We'll now move on to item G. First reading and public hearing of an ordinance providing for the abandonment of approximately 0.688 acres, 60 by 500 feet of South Marie Street being an unpaved north-south portion of street right of way located southeast of the intersection of South Bell Street and Roosevelt Street. John, you're on. Yeah, as you mentioned, this is a abandonment of uh, South End of Marie Street. You can see here on the map. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse here. Uh, you may recall that this piece just to the north of Marie Street was recently abandoned as well. Uh, so that piece no longer exists. Uh, and as you can see, this uh, piece shown in red here, um, it, it continues south from Roosevelt, but it ends here at another property. And so it does not continue all the way through. So it's basically a dead end, but it has never been constructed. And so there's no road there uh, at all. Uh, the area is uh, in the future land use for commercial uh, and the current zoning is uh, uh, of the adjacent properties is either general commercial or single family residential. Uh, you can see um, this does not provide any connectivity really to uh, for any future uh, connectivity, partly because the Marie Street to the north has been abandoned. Uh, it does end in a dead end, but even if that was ever continued, uh, it would go down to St. St. Anne and end there because of the uh, city and school district maintenance facility, it couldn't continue south at all. Did you all go out and drive that? Well, y yes, except the, the area of this right of way itself, it, the road has never been constructed. So it was platted uh, years ago and was, was never constructed. And now the owner requesting this owns the properties on both sides of the street and, and wants to proceed with a development that would tie both of those properties on either side of this together. I know, I just wanna make sure that we haven't just looked at it on a sheet of paper, that we've actually physically gone out to this property and taken a look at it and make sure that what it says on paper is what it is in reality. Uh, yes, m multiple staff have gone out and as, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, this was sent to um, all of the relevant uh, departments, public works, engineering, uh, planning and permits, as well as outside entities that we send all of these requests to, uh, including utilities um, and, and other folks like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, sure, we did send this uh, out to the surrounding property owners. Uh, we did not receive any responses, either in favor or in opposition. Uh, just a few pictures, I'll go through these pretty quickly, but- Is that water? Uh, yes, it must have been just after a rain. Um, <laughs> it's the cleanest it, water I've seen around here. You can see the picture on the right is that existing piece of uh, Marie Street that did exist, uh, but that was recently abandoned uh, by city council. And this picture on the left is looking south at the portion that, that we're talking about today. Uh, and you can see it's, it's, there's no road there. Nothing has ever been constructed. A couple more pictures. Uh, this is farther south uh, on the left is farther south uh, of the abandonment area and then the adjacent property that's currently undeveloped. And this is looking on Roosevelt Street, the street that the Marie Street comes off of. Um, Roosevelt Street is planned to be a major collector at some point uh, and I'll maybe mention that. Uh, let me go back to the map real quick. Something I did forget to mention uh, here's Roosevelt Street to the north of the subject uh, property. This Roosevelt Street on the thoroughfare plan is expected to continue uh, off to the east uh, and at some point would connect uh, into the uh, quicksand area uh, and so would be the major collector. So again, this street does not, that, that's the abandoned, proposed to be abandoned street, uh, does not provide any of that connectivity, but it would be Roosevelt that that would provide that future connection. But would you need to widen Roosevelt and use some of that property in order to widen Roosevelt when it becomes a, a, a collector street? It would, but as I mentioned, these properties to the south as well as the properties to the north that recently abandoned uh, the other part of Marie Street, 
when they come in to develop, one of the requirements of both of these abandonments would be replatting. Uh, and so at the time those properties come in for development and replat those properties, they would dedicate to the city that additional right of way that's necessary uh, for the water right of way needed for Roosevelt. All right, so that's part of the process. That's correct. Okay. Uh, uh, just briefly, as I mentioned, we did send it to relevant uh, departments as well as utility companies. All of them were in favor of this with no objections. Um, it is part of a 1930 replat, but as I already mentioned, the street was never developed. Uh, it's not in the city's master thoroughfare plan for a future extension uh, of any thoroughfare. Uh, and all of the adjacent properties already have frontage on the other streets. So it doesn't create any issues of landlocking uh, any pro properties that wouldn't have street access. Staff does recommend approval um, subject to two conditions, uh, paying the normal fee schedule assessment uh, for uh, the same for all abandonments and then that they would have to replant the property within 36 months for this to be effective. Uh, this did go to the Planning Commission in July and they also recommended approval uh, unanimously. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do, are there any questions for John James on this item? I have one, um, I don't, okay, I don't have any questions. All right, do I have a motion? Lucy, can you make a motion? Let's see. Let me get unmuted. Yes, ma'am, I make a motion to approve as presented. Okay, do I have a second? I'll Harry second. Donald, single member, just three. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Harry. And with that, let's take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. Thank you, John. Thank you. We will now move on to item H, which is the first public hearing and introduction of an ordinance amending the budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2019 and ending September 30th, 2020 for grants and capital projects. And I do have a public comment. I will read it. Um, please find my comment. Oh, this is from Alan Prest. And it says, Mayor Gunty, Gunter and members of city council, I am concerned about the proposed budget reduction to health services while our community is in the midst of a pandemic. Health services is responsible for public health emergency preparedness. preparedness. The city's website states, public health emergency preparedness is responsible for planning, preparing for, and responding to all types of public health threats and emergencies that impact the health of San Angelo. As of August 13, COVID-19 has caused the death of 41 area citizens and 364 hospitalizations. Our most recent three-day positive test was 24.1%. That is nearly five times the rate recommended for communities that have the disease under control. Earlier this meeting, council approved the designation of an alternate local health authority it would be prudent to hear from our public health officials to ensure appropriate funds are budgeted for the coming fiscal year to address the COVID-19 public health emergency. It does not seem responsible to cut funding for health services and public health emergency preparedness, preparedness in, the, in the midst of a pandemic. Too many P's going on here. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. And that's from Alan Press, resident of district number one. And with that, Tina, you're on. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, we have a um, budget amendment for you for, uh, for your approval today. Um, the first amendment will be to budget for the local match that goes with the um, Texas Water, Texas Parks and Wildlife Division grant that we received for Parks and Recreation. I'm sorry that my screen is not showing properly. Can you? It's fine. That screen was fine. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, the next is to budget for a gang suppression unit vehicle. Uh, the police department received a grant for that, $42,000. Um, the next one is for night vision equipment for SWAT officers, another grant received by the police department in the amount of $29,000. The next is to budget for rifle resistant body armor for SWAT officers, also a grant received by the police department, $32,000. Uh, 
Um, this one is to budget for the U.S. Customs Ret Retention Project. Um, it is being funded by the, the Development Corporation in the amount of $1.1 million. Next is to budget for um, Grant 40. It's the Terminal Drainage Improvement Project out at the airport, and it's um, funded by the FAA and just over $1 million. This budget amendment is to, uh, to budget for revenue received through the sale of property by the Development Corporation, as well as um, budgeting for expenditures for some projects that they have ongoing and that they will need to access their fund balance to use. And then finally, the Chadburn Street project, as we, um, as we noted earlier, this will have a variety of funding sources, including um, funding from the Development Corporation, um, they've already submitted $1.5 million over the past two years and will uh, submit an additional two and a quarter million dollars for the project. General fund operations will fund $100,000. The hotel occupancy tax fund will fund $50,000. Tiers South will fund just over a million dollars. And then of course we received a tech stock grant in the amount of $1.9 million. There are additional funding sources for the Chadburn Street project. However, some of those were internal and so we would not need to bring those to council for approval, but they were in your attachment um, that you saw as far as funding sources on that agenda item. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept the uh, budget amendments as presented? Harry Thomas, single member district three, move to approve as presented. Thank you, Harry. May I have a second? Second, Tommy Hebert, single member district one. Tommy, thank you. Um, and I just want to make one comment before we take a vote, and I want to thank the police department for being as aggressive as they have on all of those grant applications. So thank you for all that work and effort in getting those grants. And with that, let's take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. None opposed. Motion passes 7-0. We'll move on to item A, 8 on the regular agenda, which is the follow-up and administrative issues. So... A is discussion and consideration of September 2020 meeting schedule, potentially September 15th and 29th. Did council have an opportunity to take a look at their calendars and determine if that worked or if we needed to stick with the first and third Tuesdays of the month? Mayor yes, Billy DeWitt, single two. member. Just one second, Tommy Billy first. I'm Billy DeWitt, single member district six. The 15th and the 29th will work for me. Thank you. Okay, Tommy. As well as me, Mayor. Okay. And all other council members are Harry? Yeah, it works for me also. Okay, Lane. I'm good. Okay, Tom. I'll make it work. And Lucy. I'm good. Okay, so we will move the meetings to the 15th and the 29th of September. Mayor, um, yes. if I may, Tina Dierski, Director of Finance. Um, I believe that we're going to need to have an additional meeting in September um, to have a public hearing. Um, the governor has declared that that meeting must occur in person. And so we've been working with Brian Groves um, to try to figure out how to do that. And I think the best way to do that would, to be have, would be to have that one item agenda as a public hearing. And Teresa can probably speak to this as well, um, the requirements for that. Um, I know other cities are meeting in person right now. So, I mean, we're, you know, we don't have to continue with this because obviously other cities have figured out how to meet in person for these meetings. Well, this item is, is different because even though all we can meet virtually for everything else, this one public hearing is required per statute to be in person. So we have to at least give the citizens an opportunity to to come up to a location and make their comments. There are some hybrid ways to do that, which is what we're looking at with Brian, where there's a physical location where the community can come to make their comments to a virtual council, or it can be set up um, in such a way that there's still social distancing appropriate and we have people spaced out while they're waiting to make comments. If we have a large crowd to make comments. I this think is a unique option makes an awful lot of sense. And that would be on the 15th meeting? No, it would be a different date from the 15th or the 29th. Then can we not incorporate that with the one of the, I mean, or move the 15th to this meeting so we're not doing three meetings? I think that was why we tried to do the 15th and 29th to get away from three. <laughs> what I thought so too, Harry. 
And we actually requested the 15th and 29th in the hopes that the governor would change his declaration if we gave it more time. But city of Austin is moving forward with um, their meeting. And so we don't feel like he's going to make that change at this time. So to the mayor, uh, Billy DeWitt, single member district six. So to the mayor and Harry's comment, couldn't we add it to the one that we've already scheduled? On the 15th and do one public and then go into the regular virtual meeting. I would I defer to Teresa on that. <laughs> I think that it's not a matter of timing under the statute, but whether or not Brian is able to um, make that happen with the technology that we have in place. Well, we want to get it to two meetings. So let's start with, we need two meetings, figure it out, let us know how we can do it. And if it's absolutely impossible, we'll add a third meeting, but let's try to get it done in two meetings. In that case, Mayor, I would, based on what Teresa just said, I would recommend the 15th and the 29th to give Brian Groves time to figure out how we make that happen. All right, we're going to stick with the 15th and 29th and you're going to figure out how to make it work for everyone. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, with that, I will, um, entertain announcements and consideration of any future agenda items. We've covered an awful lot, but we'll entertain anything going forward. All right, with none, I would ask for a motion for adjournment. Mayor Tommy Hebert, single member district one. I move we adjourn. Thank you. A second. Harry oh. Tommy, single member district three, I move Perfect. second this. All in favor say aye. 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 We are officially adjourned at 12.02. P.M. Thank you, everyone. Everybody be safe. Bye. Bye.